Hi everyone, my name is Gerda Basra and I'm the manager of patient programs, research and advocacy here at Lymphoma Canada. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's breakout session titled Burkitt Lymphoma and Other Aggressive Lymphomas. Just before we start, I want to go through a few housekeeping items. So this Zoom software does not allow you to access chat features or turn on your microphone. If you have a question, this session will be followed up by a live Q&A, so please keep your question in mind and be sure to attend the aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas Q&A after this session. So to introduce our speaker today, we have here Dr. Natalie Johnson, who is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Oncology and director of the Division of Hematology at McGill University. She is a hematologist at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal who performs translational and clinical research since 2010. She's also the primary investigator of several clinical trials that test novel treatments for patients with newly diagnosed or relapsed lymphoma. She is also the program director for the clinical investigator program at McGill University, University and is president of the Canadian Society for Clinical Investigation. So thank you, Dr. Johnson, for joining us today, and you can get started as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for uh, Lymphoma Canada and the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak today. It's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, Burkitt lymphoma and other aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. I'd like to start by saying that I've been a consultant um, and participate in adver um, advisory boards for several uh, pharmaceutical companies, including uh, research funding from these companies. So today I want to uh, discuss the general principles of lymphoma uh, treatment. Um, we'll start with the symptoms that are associated with aggressive lymphomas, the staging and tests that we do before therapy, which are slightly different than the indolent lymphomas, and the treatment, um, the treatments that are available at the time of diagnosis and at the time of relapse, if there is a, a relapse. And I would contrast this with the more common aggressive lymphoma, which is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. To start off, I explain to my patients when they have lymphoma that lymphoma is a cancer of the immune system. And your immune system is divided into two different um, parts. The innate immune system, which are the cells that are important in fighting immediate infections. So if you get a cut, uh, you know, those cells are there, make sure that you don't have an invasive bacterial infection from your skin. Uh, the adaptive immune system are the cells, the lymphocytes that are important in controlling long-term um, infections and creating antibodies and cells that are going to attack uh, viruses and create a memory um, so that if you are reintroduced with that um, microbe in the future, you can um, fight it faster. So there, the cells that I'm going to be talking to you about the lymphomas are the most common are coming from the B lymphocytes or the B cells. And these travel throughout your body uh, through the lymphatic system and patients with lymphoma have swelling of lymph glands that you could see here as part of the green kind of lymphatic system. So they can present with swollen lymph glands under the arms, uh, arm, arm, armpits, in the uh, neck, in the chest, um, in the inguinal regions. They can have a large spleen, liver. Um, and these are common sites um, where you, the physician will uh, palpate to see if these are swollen as part of your physical exam. I like to compare lymphomas as pirates, pirates of the immune system. They will take a normal B cell, B lymphocyte, and hijack, that, hijack it to serve its own purpose. B cells are created are born in the bone marrow. And when they become mature, they leave and enter the peripheral blood um, as a naive B cell. And these naive B cells then encounter a new 
antigen. So it's something that they've never seen before. It could be part of a bacteria, virus, fungus. Um, and then they travel to the germinal center in the lymph node. Um, and there they have the help of other cells of the immune system that that show them the the um, kind of the target that they have to attack so that they could create antibodies that are very specific for this new um, this new virus, for instance. And so they rapidly um, proliferate, they grow, and those that don't have a good enough antibody die from neglect. Um, and it's a process we call apoptosis. It's a very important process. And then those that have a very high affinity, very specific antibody to the B cell receptor, BCR, it, it, it's where they communicate with the outside world. These cells will survive and they will create memory B cells so that if you are reintroduced to that um, that target in the future, you'll make antibodies faster and plasma cells that make antibodies. So this is a whole co concept of, you know, for instance, when and there was a COVID pandemic, they would, you know, these vaccines would create these cells that would produce antibodies. And what happens is that um, sometimes each, you know, step could be taken up and transform into a malignancy. So acute lymphoblastic leukemia or B lymphoblastic lymphomas are highly aggressive lymphomas or leukemias that are generally treated in the hospital uh, as acute leukemia, which is a completely different management than the other lymphomas that I will discuss for you today. The other lymphomas that I'll discuss are diffuse large B cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, double hit lymphoma, and Burkitt lymphoma. And those are all B cell lymphomas that that are originate from a cell in that um, germinal center, um, a mature B cell lymphoma. Aggressive lymphomas tend to have a rapid onset of symptoms. So typically the patients feel unwell for about a month to two to three months. Um, their symptoms are variable, they could come as a result because they have a low normal um, white blood cell count, so normal immune cells, so they can come in with infections. They can come in because they're tired, because the marrow is not producing enough red cells, or they could come in with bleeding because they're not producing enough platelets. They can have other symptoms. I, When I told you they can have lymph glands that are swollen everywhere, that, that could be a, an emergent um, symptom, but if they're in the chest, they can present with cough. If they're along the spine or in the abdomen, they can present with pain. And another symptom that is common for these aggressive lymphomas are B symptoms. They can have fevers, drenching night sweats, and weight loss. And quite often the patients are fatigued. Um, the first uh, thing that we assess after a history and a physical exam is blood work and uh, scans. So on the blood work, what we could see are abnormalities that your marrow is not producing enough cells, or you can have abnormal cells in the blood. And what you see on the left are the small, um, smaller cell, pinkish cells that are red cells, and the larger cells are uh, aggressive um, B cell lymphoma cells. So that we could see, and we can actually test those further to de to de you know to to decide or to determine which lymphoma that we're dealing with. Um, some aggressive lymphomas can present with large abdominal masses. Um, and because they're growing at such a fast rate, they can actually cause um, imbalances in some of the electrolytes in your blood, and they can cause uh, extreme elevations in um, 
a parameter that we call lactate dehydrogenase or LDH. Um, these can all lead to some organ dysfunction and kidney dysfunction. And when we do a scan, um, you know, we could see these masses. What you see in the big circle is like a large mass in the, in the abdomen. And that's a typical feature, for instance, of Burkitt lymphoma. Another diagnostic test that we do is a bone marrow biopsy. Here we take, we put the patient in a lying um, position and we take a, a sample of the bone marrow, uh, which is typically in the um, iliac spine and the iliac crest. Um, and this allows us to see uh, you know, if the bone marrow is affected by the lymphoma and could be actually the primary way to diagnose the lymphoma subtype. Another type of test that we could do is a lymph node biopsy where we take the enlarged lymph node, we look at it under the microscope and we can determine the lymphoma subtype. What you're seeing on the right is a typical um, example of what we see in Burkitt lymphoma. So everything that's purple represents cells, the lymphoma cells that are dividing. Um, and that purple is, is DNA. That, that's what colors it purple. And the white is all the normal immune cells that are trying to sop up all the dying cells because they're growing so fast. They're out um, living their, their, their supply, their nutrient supply. And so this is what we call a star, starry sky appearance. Um, we call it a, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because we don't see any Hodgkin cells. So some, you know, often my patients would say, well, what's the difference between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's? What I'm talking to you about is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the most common. And that's because there's no Hodgkin cells. And the, what you see on the, on the bottom right is... Um, is a, a Hodgkin's Reed per, Sternberg cell. And they're completely different lymphomas that require different therapies. Once we perform those uh, diagnostic tests, we wanna know where, um, where is the lymphoma? Uh, and this is what we refer to as staging. Uh, limited stage means stage one or two, one or two areas um, on one side of the diaphragm. And advanced stage is stage three, so where the disease is on both sides of the diaphragm, and stage four, meaning their lymphoma has spread to other non-lymph uh, node sites. And then we also uh, classify it with these symptoms, whether they have fever, sweats, or night, um, uh, or weight loss. In some aggressive lymphomas, especially Burkitt and double hit lymphoma, we carefully evaluate the central nervous system. And that's because these lymphomas tend to invade uh, the spinal uh, cord or the liquid surrounding the brain and the spine, uh, or even the brain itself. So we uh, perform imaging and we can do a, a lumbar puncture where we take the um, the liquid and analyze it under a microscope to see if these cells are there. And that requires additional um, therapies that is specific towards the brain because a lot of the uh, medications that we have don't cross the blend brain barrier. So typically, even if the brain is not involved in some, in some of the lymphomas, especially Burkitt's, we give intrathecal chemotherapy just to protect the brain. Aggressive lymphomas require intensive chemotherapy. Um, and um, often it's not uncommon that we um, have to make sure that the patients are fit enough to receive this chemotherapy. The most common test that we do is to assess the heart function, make sure that it's well enough to, to, um, to take uh, the, the chemotherapy that, that uh, we give for lymphomas. And um, and some of the lymphomas require central venous access because they require that the anti that the uh, chemotherapy is given over several hours or several days, and um, you know some of these uh, 
venous access are called PIC lines, for instance, or Broviac, Portacath, um, and those are, are fairly common. And the treatment for aggressive lymphomas is chemotherapy. It's not surgery, um, and it's very rarely radiation unless it's given palliatively. It's given intravenously and uh, often intrathecally, um, especially in the context of Burkitt lymphoma or, um, or, or double hit lymphoma. Okay, so let's talk about the treatment um, and the different lymphoma subtypes. So the most common aggressive, uh, aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and that's what it looks like under the microscope, what you see in that black box. And using sophisticated protein and genetic testing, we could distinguish two uh, subtypes of uh, this uh, type of lymphoma, the primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma, and a high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MYC and BCL2 translocations, but we will refer to this as double hit lymphoma. So the treatment for uh, DLBCL or diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is a combination chemotherapy that we call R-CHOP. And CHOP refers to four drugs. So the CHOP are four different drugs uh, that we use. Um, given every three weeks for six months. And the reason we use this, and it hasn't changed, you know, for uh, a few decades now, is because we tested this therapy um, with more aggressive chemotherapies where we add more letters. And the result was that it, these were just more toxic and they were um, not more effective than CHOP alone. And what you see here is a survival curve. And I'm gonna show a few of these throughout my talk. On the X axis, you get you have time. And on the Y axis is the uh, percent survival. So what you wanna see when there's a survival advantage is that the curve will be higher than the others. And what you could see here is that the CHOP curves are exactly overlapping the more aggressive ones, and that's why we use to this day CHOP as a backbone. Now, this is in contrast to CHOP versus R-CHOP on the right, where you see a clear definition that the top curve is superior, result, resulted in a 50% improvement in overall survival when we used R to combine with CHOP. R is short for rituximab it binds to a protein on the surface of the lymphoma cell and acts as a flag so that your immune system could see this as being abnormal and get rid of it. And that really has been the main, um, I think, advance uh, or significant advance in lymphoma therapy over uh, the past few decades. Okay, so when do we use something that's a little bit different than our chop. So here we're coming into the nitty gritty details of the different aggressive lymphoma subtypes. Primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma is a lymphoma that resembles, looks like DLBCL, but it's the clinical presentation is a little bit different. Typically we see it in younger patients, young women, it often presents as a large lymph node mass in the chest, which we call mediastinum. It shares features with Hodgkin's lymphoma, but it really is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And typically it has a very favorable outcome, even with RCHOP alone. And what you're seeing on the left-hand side are survival curves of patients that have different lymphoma subtypes based on the molecular signature. So what does that mean? It means that primary mediastinal is on the top curve where 90% of patients do very well with RCHOP alone versus the germinal center B-cell DLBCL or the activated B-cell lymphoma. Um, and those are different subtypes of DLBCL that have 
a less favorable outcome. So the treatment for DLBCL, uh, sorry, the, for PMBCL is slightly different. Although RCHOP can be used, most, um, most hospitals in Canada will use dose-adjusted rituximab and EPOC. So EPOC is the same as CHOP, except that it has a little bit, like a one extra drug. But the distinction between this therapy and our CHOP is that this is given over five days, intravenous on a pump. The patient needs a PICC line and you get a little bit of the chemotherapy every day. And there's a theoretical advantage that this may be better. This was tested at the National Institute of Health in the, in the United States where they developed it. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it's a pretty good survival curve, but there's only one curve. It's never been tested against CHOP or our CHOP. And most of the patients do phenomenally well. And based on this, it is, I would say the favored regimen for, uh, for, primary mediastinal, but it comes with more side effects, a higher risk of an infection. And the dose of the chemotherapy is based on your blood test that you do the week after your chemotherapy twice a week. So it's it's definitely more intensive. Uh, this regimen is often used also to treat double hit lymphoma. So what is double hit lymphoma? This is in contrast to primary mediastinal who has a great outcome, double hit has a worse outcome. And that's because it has two genetic rearrangements that really um, make the lymphoma cells more resistant. It has, it really um, accelerates the cells to go and undergo cell division from upregulation of the MYC gene. So MYC, you can anticipate it's just pressing on the gas and it's just like speeding up the lymphoma cells to divide. It also has a genetic rearrangement in BCL2 and that prevents the cells from dying. So it it's like if you remove the brakes and just step on the gas. As you can imagine, not a very good scenario. And what you see on the left is if you compare the outcomes with patients with double hit DHIT, um, they have an inferior outcome versus those that have DLBCL. And when we look at different treatment regimens, now this is a busy slide, um, but what I want you uh, to kind of maybe focus on, on the right-hand side, there's intensive regimens that have the upper curve and dose-adjusted EPOC is the most, kind of the least toxic of the intensive regimens that we use. It may be associated with a better outcome, but this is based on retrospective, meaning, you know, historical uh, controls, and there's no trial that systematically tests this. And on the bottom right-hand slide, you see that the intensive regimens don't necessarily um, associate with an inf a superior overall survival, but certainly have a longer duration of remission. So that's the, those are the treatments for... Um, PMBCL and double hit. We're now gonna focus on Burkitt lymphoma. Burkitt lymphoma is a completely different lymphoma subtype. It was actually discovered before the other, the more the lymphomas that I discussed to you, with you before. It's um, it was discovered by Dennis Burkitt in 1958. It is the most rapidly proliferating cancer. It's the most the cells divide within six hours, um, and it's driven by a genetic rearrangement in MYC, which I had just told you that it's like stepping on the gas, right? So there's three forms of Burkitt's. There's the endemic form, which 
in we see in Africa. And we see this in young children where they get uh, it's it's um, driven also by the Epstein-Barr virus. This is the virus that causes mononucleosis. 100% of the, these children have them. Cancer. There's the sporadic, meaning random, uh, which we see in children and young adults. They present with large abdominal masses. 10 to 20% have central nervous system disease or CNS disease. And it's more commonly seen in men. And then we have the immunosuppressed version, um, which we typically see in patients with HIV, so uh, AIDS. Um, and here we see incidence of involvement of the brain and, this, and the central nervous system in 20 to 30% of patients. The treatment of Burkitt lymphoma is very aggressive, intensive, chemotherapy. There's no trial looking at uh, the different regimens, comparing different regimens, because it's actually pretty rare. It represents only 3% of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. But what you see on the right is a survival curve of children who had received a historical kind of standard low-dose therapy, CHOP, um, versus those that receive what we call a McGrath regimen. So Codox, MRA, IVAC, all of these letters represent a different drug. So it's very intense. It's four months in hospital given, you know, a three, three day or a week break in between the four cycles. Uh, and they're based on pediatric protocol. So children can, can tolerate this. This is not tolerated in older adults. Um, and it includes drugs that penetrate into the brain, so it really protects the brain, but it comes at a high um, immediate toxicity, and like most patients get infected, they need transfusions, and that's why they're in hospital. But the overall outcome is better, and that's why it's favored, though the um, NIH has tested dosage-adjusted EPOC in patients with Burkitt lymphoma. These are highly motivated patients that can travel to the NIH to get this. This is outpatient therapy as opposed to inpatient. I discussed with you that these are therapies that are given over a week at a time, but patients go home um, in between. And we see that there are some patients that do really, really well um, if there is no involvement of the central nervous system. So greater than 90% of them do well and survive compared to those with the lower curve, which is uh, brain involvement. And what you could see on the left, I circled the um, the initial uh, time that you that you will see the differences in outcome. And then the, the curve flattens, means that there's no relapse. After two years, if you are um, have receive treatment for Burkitt lymphoma, you're cured. It, it will not come back. So the considerations for Burkitt's is that because the cells divide so quickly, you can have a phenomenon called tumor lysis syndrome. And this causes salt imbalances in the blood, the minerals. We need to, to take that into account, make sure that the, the patient it has a, a lot of hydration on board to protect the kidneys, but not too much because there's a drug that can actually go into some um, areas if there's if there's water in the lungs or or in the abdomen. It can we call that a third space, and and methotrexate could kind of stay there and cause toxicity. So there's a lot of considerations here that are. Um, important that we don't necessarily take into consideration um, in patients with other uh, lymphomas. Sometimes we omit rituximab, the first cycle, and hepatitis B, those who've had exposure to hepatitis B um, is, is always an issue. In fact, most patients that have had exposure are on uh, antiviral therapy during their entire uh, treatment with Burkitt's and other uh, lymphoma subtypes. 
All right. So those are the frontline therapies. What happens if the lymphoma comes back and there's a relapse? The standard of care has been for many, many years to give a different type of chemotherapy, what we call salvage chemotherapy, and give an autologous stem cell transplant, which means we collect the cells from the marrow, and then we give a really intense chemotherapy that would either damage the cells, but because we've collected them, the patient is fine. And once we give that high-dose chemotherapy, we re- um, introduce the, the stem cells. We, we, it's like a blood transfusion. Um, and then, uh, the patient is in hospital for about a month. It's intense. It's not given to uh, patients who are not fit or, um, or too old for this therapy. And the, you could see that this historical trial resulted in transplant winning over just giving chemotherapy. However, Things have changed in the past month, actually, um, in, in that CAR T-cell therapy, it's a different type of immunotherapy, is now the standard of care for most patients who have relapsed lymphoma. This is a, it's the Ferrari, uh, literally, of, of lymphoma treatment. Um, the cells are collected from the patient. They're then uh, sent to the manufacturing company where they introduce this, this viral vector that makes the cells attack the CD19 protein on the, on the B cells and on the lymphoma cells. So once those cells are, are engineered, they're frozen and they're sent back to the site and given back to the patient. So it's kind of like uh, it's it's very custom. It has each patient um, has their own therapy that is is um, that is is manufactured from their own cells. It's not an off the shelf therapy, which is why it's uh, it's time consuming to to prepare this, but also very uh, costly. The first trial that looked at the outcome of patients. Uh, treated with this CAR T therapy resulted in uh, patients who had uh, multiply relapsed um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or aggressive lymphoma. And you could see that approximately a third of patients have long term survival and benefits, which is we have never seen this type of, of benefit in, in this type of patient population. And the important thing is that when you're in remission and you have a low disease burden at the time of the CAR T, you do better. There, they, uh, the company, the sponsor uh, producing this type of, of cell, which is called AxiCell, the trial name is Zuma7. And the this trial randomized patients or compared two different uh, therapies, right? They compared patients once they've had a first relapse of their DLBCL to receive a CAR T cell or an autologous stem cell transplant, which is ASCT. And what you see in this curve is that the orange curve has a marked improvement in both progression-free survival and overall survival. So we're curing more patients by giving them CAR T cell therapy than by giving them um, a transplant. And this is the overall survival curve. And what you see that even um, this benefit was marked, even if the patients who received the transplant got CAR T in the third line. So they had the transplant and then they got CAR. So this is uh, now considered standard of care, um, but it's slowly being introduced in Canada, given that it's just been reimbursed in some provinces. So um, for those who have uh, a relapsed lymphoma, it may or may not be available depending where you are. So some patients are not a candidate for CAR T or uh, transplant because these are, you know, their, their therapies, their cell therapy come with increased toxicity. 
uh, neurotoxicity. A lot of you know patients go to can go to the intensive care unit, so you need to be fit. Um, so there are alternative therapies for not for patients who can't have these um, cell therapies. Uh, one is polituzumab and bendamustine rituximab. Um, and this is available to all patients except those that live in Quebec because the regulatory bodies in Quebec did not approve this drug um, based on it was not a randomized trial. So what you're seeing on, a, on the right-hand side are the curves in the blue that are patients with uh, that were treated with Pola BR and historical controls that are uh, just treated with BR. So this is not a, a clinic, like a randomized trial and an, an, it's an inferior design. And, and for whatever reason, it was felt that in Quebec that they didn't approve this. But the, the overall response rate, the re patients respond, 50% have a complete response and the duration of response or the, the, the average remission time is, is approximately nine months. Tafacitimab and lenalidomide are, are available um, only to patients in Quebec. Here is like conu the conundrum, the problems that we have to diff with different regulatory uh, um, bodies uh, in, in our country. The Tafacitimab is an antibody that targets CD19, which is the similar antibody uh, or similar target uh, for CAR. Um, and lenalidomide is, is a type of immunotherapy uh, that can activate the different immune cells, the uh, NK cells, the macrophages. And the, there is a non-randomized trial. So just patients who were treated with this, this um, antibody cocktail and drug, which lenalidomide is a pill. Um, and we see that there's a, a patient population that, do, that does respond uh, to this drug. So the complete response rate is CR is at one year was 43%. The overall response rate is 60%. Not all patients respond, but if the patient have a good, if the patients have a good response, they can have a durable response. So another option for patients who have uh, relapsed DLBCL um, across Canada are um, by specific T cell engagers. So bites, the two uh, drugs that are approved are glofitimab and epcoridimab. Um, and these are, are very interesting off the shelf antibodies that target CD20. So it's the same target as rituximab. And my pharmacist um, likes to, to compare this to a tinder for your immune system. So in other words, it brings your T cells, which are important in killing your lymphoma cells in close contact to the lymphoma cells. And remarkably, this is a very effective way to kill lymphoma cells. In a third to 40% of patients, they can have meaningful and durable responses to these drugs. Um, the difference between the two are that glofitimab is given intravenously and it's given for a 12 cycles, a maximum of 12 cycles, so a year, a fixed duration therapy versus epcoridimab is given subcutaneously, so SC, um, and it's given until progression. So in summary, um, aggressive lymphomas and Burkitt lymphomas require uh, intensive chemotherapy, uh, typically for approximately four to six months. The three regimens that we use commonly in Canada are dose-suggested EPOC, um, CODOX MRIVAC, or the McGrath protocol for um, Burkitt's, and RCHOP. Pati patients who are young and fit, or older and but still fit, the treatment is given with curative intent. So expect um, that these intensive therapies come with side effects, but the goal is to give the therapy on time and try to, 
to manage the side effects with other medications and try to limit um, uh, delaying a chemotherapy. And in the relapse setting, there are alternative therapies that are available with DLB for DLPCL, um, primary mediastinal B cell lymphoma, and double hit lymphoma. These include CAR T uh, cell therapy, uh, bites or bispecific T cell engagers. So those are um, two different uh, types of immune therapies. There's tafacitamide, lenalidomide. Uh, sorry, tafacitamab and lenalidomide, yeah, or uh, pola BR. And in some circumstances, uh, stem cell transplant is an option, autologous, and even um, in exceptional circumstances, allogeneic stem cell transplant. So that's what I have to discuss with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions at the uh, question and answer period. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that informative presentation. So this session will be followed by a short break. I encourage you to perhaps take some time to stand up and stretch, explore the various tabs with our patient resources, or you can take some time to complete our conference survey. And after the break, please be sure to attend the aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas Q&A to have your questions addressed by Dr. Natalie Johnson. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and see you there. <laughs>